Mac Dre is a Bay Area legend who helped put the hypey movement on the map. But before he could get the shine he deserved, he was tragically murdered, and the case is still unsolved. Today we're breaking down all the details in his wild rise to fame and tragic murder. Mac Dre was born in Oakland, but grew up mostly in Vallejo, California. His family eventually moved to the Country Club Crest neighborhood, which is where he started making music. Mac Dre and his friends started as breakdancers, and in junior high, he bought a microphone and started rapping in the garage. While he was in high school, he started making waves in the Bay Area with his song, Too Hard for the Fucking Radio. He started hanging around another big rapper from Vallejo named Michael the Mac Robinson, who taught him the game and even gave him his rap name, Mac Dre. He recorded his first three projects between 1988 and 1992 and was making a name for himself in the Bay. But before he could take things to the next level, he got caught up in a wild situation that put his career on hold for the next few years. On March 26, 1992, Mac took a road trip to Fresno, California with his homies Jay Diggs and Kilo Kurt. He did a show in the city two weeks before and met a woman. So they decided to go back so he could spend time with her. But on the way back to Vallejo, they were pulled over and surrounded by cops from both the Vallejo Police Department and the FBI. Police said that while Mac was at a motel with his girl, his friends were planning a bank robbery. They found out about the robbery and were going to wait to catch him in the act. But the local media heard about it on the police scanner. News crews showed up before the robbery even happened which tipped off Kilo Kurt and Jay Diggs the police were on to him. At the time, they were also investigating a wave of bank robberies that had been happening in the Vallejo area, so they were convinced that Mac Dre and his crew were somehow involved with the other robberies. Mac claimed he was completely innocent and was in a motel room the entire time, but he refused to snitch on his homies, so he ended up getting arrested with them and charged with conspiracy to commit bank robbery. He also refused to take a plea deal and took the case to trial, where he was found guilty and caught a five-year sentence. Kilo Kurt and Jay Diggs ended up getting 10 years each for being the alleged masterminds. Some fans felt like Mac was being unfairly targeted because he was a popular gangster rapper who spoke out about police brutality. After he was arrested, he even dropped a track called Punk Police where he called out members of the Vallejo PD by name. On the song, he rapped, I could maybe understand if I was breaking the law, and I'ma dedicate this to Detective McGraw. You be steady accusing, but these cases you losing. You be steady abusing, man. Do you find it amusing? Detective McGraw was the one leading the case, and he even tried to use the song lyrics in court to prove Mac was guilty. The trial also brought more details to light about what went down. Police found out about the plans because there was a fourth man with them on the trip named Corey Dunn, who had flipped and turned to an informant. Dunn was wearing a wire on the trip to Fresno, which is how police learned that they were planning a robbery. But they discussed it on the police scanner and accidentally tipped off the media. Corey Dunn was gunned down inside a garage in Vallejo in 2010. It's unclear if it was related to snitching on Mac Dre, but it easily could have put a target on his back. Even if he was innocent, Mac kept it solid and did his time. He was eventually released in early 1996 after serving four years. Those years behind bars gave him a new perspective on life. So as soon as he got out, Mac went right back to making music. He hit the studio the day he was released, and within a few weeks, he already finished a new album, but he started to switch up his style after getting out of prison. His delivery was way more upbeat and sounded like dance music. That's when his career really started to take off, and Mac Dre was getting played in all the local clubs. He'd also get on stage and do a bunch of crazy dance moves no one had ever seen, which became known as the Thizzle Dance. Mac Dre's new sound and style helped lay the foundation for the hyphy movement that would pop off in the Bay a few years later. Over the next few years, Mac dropped back-to-back -back albums and continued to build his buzz. He started pitching tracks to major labels and even started his own company, Thizzle Entertainment. The hyphy sound was especially popular in Missouri, and he started booking shows in Kansas City and St. Louis. He knew expanding into new areas would help him grow his fan base, but Mac Dre had no idea it would also cost him his life. On Halloween weekend, 2004, Mac was booked for a few shows at the Kansas City National Guard Armory alongside other popular Bay Area artists like Yuckmouth and Kick the Sneak. He was booked by a promoter named Damon Whitmill, who agreed to pay Mac around $12,500 for two shows. Mac and his entourage arrived in Kansas City on October 27th so he could do a radio show and record signing at a local bookstore to promote the event. According to the promoter Damon, Mac showed up with a huge crew of over 20 people and was late. On the day of the first performance, he didn't show up until 30 minutes after he was supposed to wrap up, and when he did perform, his crew rushed the stage, causing a surge in the crowd. The show eventually had to be shut down before the end of his set, and the whole scene was tense. Keep the Sneak and Yuckmouth realized something was off, so they decided to leave after the first show, but Mac Dre stayed to finish out the weekend. The promoter booked Mac for another show on Sunday to try and recoup some of the money he lost the first night, but he claims Mac was late again and left after only 30 minutes. 
According to Jake Diggs, Mac did what he was supposed to do and only left the venue after getting into a fight with the promoter because he refused to pay Mac when he was still owed. Whatever happened, Mac left the venue and got into a white van to go back to his hotel. The van was traveling north on Highway 71 around 2.30 a.m. when a dark sedan pulled up next to it and started letting off shots. Over 30 shots were fired from an automatic rifle and a 45 caliber pistol. The sedan also ran the van off the road, causing it to crash into a ditch, but the driver managed to get out and ran to the hotel to call the police. Sadly, by the time help arrived, Mac Dre was already gone. He was pronounced dead on the scene from a bullet wound to the back of the neck. Mac Dre's death shocked the entire world and everyone wanted to know who was responsible, but fans would never get the answers they were looking for. No one knows exactly what happened that night and the case is still unsolved to this day, but there are a few different theories about what might have happened. One of the first suspects was the promoter, Damon Whitmill. Not only was Damon an amateur concert promoter, he was also a small time drug dealer who grew up in the Kansas City area. During the investigation, police interviewed Damon about what had happened that weekend and asked him if he'd be willing to submit a DNA sample. Damon said he needed to check with his lawyer, Carl Bussey, before giving him out swap. But when detectives followed up with the lawyer, Carl, a few days later, he said that his client Damon refused to give a DNA sample. Damon didn't want the DNA to end up in a database that could be used to tie him to other crimes. Even though that seemed pretty shady, Damon was still at the venue when the shooting went down. The police didn't have any direct evidence tying him to the crime, so Damon was never arrested. But years later, the police learned more information that would make them believe Damon may have ordered the hit. In 2008, the main investigator on the case, Detective Everett Babcock, spoke to a confidential informant named David Thibault, who was already in jail on unrelated charges. The informant David said that he grew up with the promoter Damon in Kansas City and had once heard him bragging about having Mac Dre killed. The informant David even named the alleged shooters and claimed that one of them was a dude who went by the name Papoose. Detective Babcock realized he might have been telling the truth because the name Papoose had come up earlier in the investigation. Not long after the murder, Detective Babcock received a tip from the local media who told them a man had contacted them about a car that had been dumped behind his house a few hours after Mac Dre was killed. The caller told them he saw two black men in their 20s dish a black infinity behind his property and then get into a faded blue van with tinted windows, but he didn't get a good look at the suspects or the driver. When the police recovered the infinity, they saw four bullet holes in the back seat on the passenger side that came from someone shooting inside the car. There were also bullet shells all over the back seat and white paint alongside the car, showing they had hit into a white vehicle. So it was pretty clear this was the car used in Mac Dre's murder. When police did a search, they found out the vehicle had been stolen from a garage in Belton, Missouri a few months before. They also received several tips that witnesses had seen a dude named Elijah Taylor driving the stolen infinity. When they interviewed Elijah, he said that he was only driving the car because he thought it belonged to his friend, Rick Hill. Elijah also admitted that his friend may have stolen it, but didn't want to ask too many questions. When they interrogated the friend, Rick, he told the police that he sold the car to a man named Papoose. Elijah also confirmed that the same man had given him a ride in the Infinity after buying it from Rick. When asked to identify Papoose in the lineup, Elijah chose a man named Calvert Antoine II. Calvert Antoine was well known to Kansas City police. His father, Calvert Antoine Sr., was a famous drug lord in the area who was found guilty of double homicide in 1983. Calvert Sr. pleaded guilty to the murder of two brothers, George and Winston Jones, who were rival dealers. He was originally sentenced to death for the crime, but it was eventually overturned after the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Papoose was still a baby when his dad was arrested for the murder, and from an early age, he was also in the streets. He was first arrested for selling drugs within a thousand feet of a school when he was 18 and had a long rap sheet in the state of Missouri. Several witnesses claim they saw Papoose driving the black infinity that was believed to be used in Mac Dre's murder. An unnamed source told police that on the night Mac Dre was killed, Papoose had asked him if he wanted to go to a rap concert. The source declined, but he later saw Papoose and an associate burning their clothes in an alley behind his home. So, when Detective Babcock heard the informant David Thibault mention Papoose's name and connect him to the promoter Damon Whitmill, it all started to add up. Plus, he was also not the only one who claimed the promoter Damon had something to do with it. The same year Detective Babcock spoke to the informant David, a dude named Savino DeVia also started talking. Savino was friends with Mac Dre and had connections in the local rap scene. He was also the one who picked Mac up from the airport in Kansas City and helped arrange his transportation that weekend. Even though he wasn't the one driving, it was Savino's van that Mac was in when he got murdered. But Savino wasn't just a hip-hop head, he was also a big-time drug dealer, and according to prosecutors, he imported more than 330 pounds of cocaine into the state of Kansas between 2000 and 2006. In 2008, he pled guilty to drug trafficking charges, which is when he contacted Detective Babcock and told him he had information about the murder of Mac Dre. 
Savino told Detective Babcock that on the night of Mac's murder, he had taken his kids trick-or-treating and sent his friend Harold Piercy to take him where he needed to go. But after the show, Savino claims Mac called him and complained that the event was unorganized. He even admitted that he didn't feel safe. Savino originally told police that he didn't find out about the murder until the next morning, but after his conviction, he started to change his story. Savino told police that the promoter, Damon, was angry Mac had left the show early, so he called him to find out their location. Savino then called Piercy, who told him where they were. That's when Damon allegedly sent Papoose and an associate named Tehran, Baby T. Smith, to kill Mac Dre. Savino originally left out the part about giving up his location as he didn't want to get wrapped up in the crime. So when he got locked up, Savino thought he could use it to get a lighter sentence. But then he changed his mind again and later took back his statement because he was afraid of being labeled a snitch. So, Savino was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the drug case. Even with all the tips and information connecting Papoose and Damon to the crime, police can never make an arrest. Mostly because Damon and Papoose both try to pin it on someone else. A local Kansas City rapper named Anthony Fat Tone Watkins. Fat Tone was also well known to Kansas City police. In 2001, he was convicted of double murder for allegedly killing a 19-year-old woman and her unborn child. He spent nine months locked up, but the case was eventually dismissed after he filed an appeal and the witnesses failed to cooperate. Once he got out, Fat Tone started a rap career and used his new image as a ruthless killer who just beat a body to help sell records. He was building a local buzz and even started collaborating with artists from the Bay Area whose sound was catching on in Kansas City. Mac Dre, Messy Marv, and Killer Wolf all appeared on Fat Tone's first album, only in Killer City. He also stayed in contact with Mac and even linked up with him the weekend he was killed. After Mac's death, rumors started going around that he and Fat Tone had gotten into an argument over stage time during the show at the Armory. Police received dozens of tips claiming there had been some sort of altercation between the two rappers. Fat Tone denied this, and the police could never confirm that it actually happened. But that didn't stop the rumors from spreading that Fat Tone was somehow involved. Fat Tone had a bad reputation in the area. Every time there was a shooting in the city, police received calls claiming he might have been involved. So because he was hanging out with Mac Dre hours before he was killed and there may have been tension between them, Fat Tone looked guilty. Even though police were still investigating Papoose and Damon the promoter, rumors were getting so crazy that police started looking more into Fat Tone. When Detective Babcock finally caught up with Papoose, he denied any involvement in Mac Dre's death. But in 2006, Papoose finally admitted to driving the stolen Infinity that was used in the murder, except he claims that he sold it to Fat Tone the day before it all went down. Detective Babcock did not believe his story, but he had no way to prove he was lying. And during his interview with the informant David DeVoe, he claimed that Damon and Papoose were the ones who were spreading rumors that it was Fat Tone who killed Mac Dre, even though they knew he was innocent. So it seemed like Fat Tone was being set up, but that didn't stop the streets from talking and spreading the story that he was the killer. There was even a rumor that Fat Tone had recorded a diss track where he admitted to killing Mac Dre, even though he actually dropped the track where he denied being involved. On his mixtape, My Hood Betrayed Me Volume 4, Fat Tone addressed the rumors head on in the intro, Can't Fuck With A G. He said, I'm tired of you suckers, put my motherfucking name in your mouth, nigga. You don't know me, quit talking about me, nigga. One love to my nigga Mac Dre, who you groupies thought I killed, nigga. That's my motherfucking nigga, you dumb bitch. Quit putting that shit on the streets like that, before I slide up on your punk ass. But sometimes, when a lie is more entertaining than the truth, it's hard to change people's minds. Tragically, Fat Tone never got the chance to prove his innocence, and he was gunned down a few months after the murder of Mac Dre. On May 22, 2005, Fat Tone and his friend Jermaine Atkins were in Vegas for a Snoop Dogg concert. That night, he called his friends and family bragging about his gambling wins and even said that he was hoping to meet Snoop at 50 Cent. But even though he seemed to be having the night of his life, he had no idea it would also be his last. In the early morning of May 23rd, the bodies of Fat Tone and Jermaine Atkins were discovered by a security guard in an empty housing development that was under construction. Tone had been shot about 20 times and was slumped over in the front seat of a blue 1992 Toyota Tercel. Atkins had been shot another 13 times and was laying on the ground a few feet away. It turns out Fat Tone wasn't just in town to gamble and see a show, he was also doing business. He had come out to Vegas to meet with the rapper and promoter from the Bay Area named Andre Dow, aka Mac Minister, who was helping connect him to big artists. Security footage from the MGM Grand showed Mac Minister with Fat Tone and Jermaine Atkins hours before the murder. According to police, Mac had called Fat Tone around 2 a.m. on the morning of the 23rd and told him to meet him in the parking lot of the building where his body was discovered. But when they pulled up, he wasn't there. While they were waiting, a Pontiac pulled up beside them and started letting off shots from an AK-47. Mac Minister was wanted for questioning, and police believed the murder was retaliation for the death of Mac Dre. Days later, 
police received a tip about an abandoned Pontiac where the murder took place and went to investigate. They found out the vehicle was registered to a woman named Lee Larson. After doing some digging, police found out that Lee was a prostitute who was working for Mac Minister and his friend Jason Corleone Mathis. Records show that Jason Corleone rented a house less than five blocks from the murder scene where Lee may have been setting people up. Police arrested Jason Corleone, but Mac Minister was still on the run. Lee Larson was refusing to cooperate with the police, so they had no idea where he could possibly be. But even though Lee refused to snitch, it seemed like she was in over her head and got involved with the wrong people. On November 5, 2005, Lee Larson's dead body was discovered in a park in Fairfield, California, a city not far from Vallejo. So, police knew they had to find Mac Minister before anyone else got hurt. They searched for him everywhere, but didn't catch up to him until March 2006, almost a year after the murder of Fat Tone and Jeremiah Atkins. Mac Minister and Jason Corleone were both charged with two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of conspiracy to commit murder. The trial lasted less than a week before the jury found him guilty of first-degree murder and they were both sentenced to life without parole. No one truly knows why Mac Minister decided to take out Fat Tone. Even though he was from the Bay, he didn't even know Mac Dre. But according to rumors, he was mad that Mac's friends had not gotten revenge for his death and felt it made the Bay look bad. So, he decided to take things into his own hands. According to Mac Dre's own friends, they didn't do anything because they knew Fat Tone was innocent. So, Mac Minister might have crashed out for no reason just because of a rumor started by the actual killer. But there are some people who don't believe Mac Dre's friends and think he may have been backdoored by his own people. Years later, another Bay Area rapper named JT the Bigger Figure came out and exposed Mac Dre's friends, Jay Diggs and Kilo Kurt, for being involved with the murder. Yeah, Kilo Kurt, Diggs, they know who did it. They was cool with this nigga. JT the Bigger Figure claims that at the time, Kilo Kurt was handling some of the back end business for this entertainment and Jay Diggs was his bodyguard. It was some tension between Mac Dre and Kilo Kurt. Jay Diggs was more of a bodyguard. Jay Diggs wasn't a rapper. Mac was supposedly booked for a show in Fresno that was paying him $6,000, and Kilo Kurt went to pick up the cash, but he only gave Mac $1,500 and pocketed the rest. Mac found out about it and asked Kilo Kurt what was going on. They got into an argument, and Mac fired Kilo Kurt from being his manager. So, Kilo Kurt didn't collect any money from the show in Kansas City and was pressed Mac cut him up. JT the bigger figure doesn't accuse Kilo Kurt or Jay Diggs of committing the murder, but he does suggest that they knew about it and let it happen. Then, after his death, Kilo Kurt ended up being put in charge of Diggs Entertainment, even though he was allegedly fired right before the murder. Jay Diggs later responded and said it was all cap, and they didn't even know anyone in Kansas City to get Mac lined up. Plus, he wasn't even in town when the murder happened, so at this point, it's his word against JT's. There are still a lot of unanswered questions about the murder of Mac Dre. But unfortunately, most of the people who have the answers are long gone or refuse to talk. Fat Tone is dead, and Mac Minister is still claiming he was wrongfully charged. He's been fighting for early release ever since, but keeps getting denied. In 2014, Papoose was also murdered in a way that is shockingly similar to how Mac Dre was killed. Police found his body inside an SUV after someone had run him off the road during a shootout. Savino DeVille was released from prison in 2022 after serving 14 years as part of the First Step Act that allowed prisoners with long sentences to get their time reduced. The promoter Damon Whitmill is rumored to still be alive and living in Kansas City. Only the people involved know what truly happened to Mac Dre that night, but the Bay Area lost a true legend, and Mac Dre will go down in history as one of the most influential rappers in the history of Northern California.